Welcome everyone. I'm Rebecca Roberts. I'm the curator of programming at Planet Word. We are a museum of words and language in the historic Franklin School in downtown Washington, DC. That's it in my Zoom background. I hope many of you have had a chance to come visit us in person. We are open Thursdays through Sundays, 10 to five. Uh, if you're not here in Washington or not quite ready to go to a museum in these pandemic times, um, I'm delighted you're joining us virtually. Uh, one of the silver linings of this pandemic has been the ability to have these virtual conversations and welcome people from all over. So we will continue them uh, even after we're able to welcome people uh, to in-person programming in the museum. So keep an eye uh, on our website or subscribe to our newsletter, follow us on social media. That's the way you'll see our upcoming programs. Um, if you're a member of Planet Word, thank you so much for that support. We are, as you know, a free admission museum and uh, membership is one of the ways we're able to stay that way. So uh, that support's vital. Uh, if you're not a member and would like to become one, um, it's really easy and fast and um, you can do it on our website, planetwordmuseum.org. And I think that is it for housekeeping. So we can dive in. I'm delighted to introduce our guest, James Pennebaker, who's a psychologist at the University of Texas, Austin, joining us from steamy Austin. Um, he's also, he's on our advisory board at the museum um, and our founder, Ann Friedman, really credits his book, The Secret Life of Pronouns, with really influencing the way she thought about the content when forming Planet Word. So he's had a very formative voice uh, in understanding the role words play uh, in life and language. So um, we are delighted to have him here tonight. James Pennebaker, welcome and thanks for being here. It's so great to be here. And I love Planet Word and uh, what you, what Ann Friedman and the entire group has done has been amazing. Well, thank you. Yeah, um, we're pretty proud of it, I must be said. <laughs> um, so the secret life of pronouns is sort of about how those little functional words, articles and pronouns and words that we don't pay a lot of attention to can actually say a lot about who we are and what we're like. Um, and that's not really the topic of what we're talking about tonight, but I'd love to sort of uh, get that perspective on that connection between the way we use language and the way we live our lives. So. I've lived this interesting uh, research life, and I actually started off as a social psychologist in, it, in looking at uh, groups and, and behaviors and health and things like that. And I stumbled into this world of expressive writing, which we'll be talking about today, where, where I discovered that if people are asked to write about upsetting experiences, it had a, a powerful impact on their physical and mental health. From that work on writing, I discovered that the ways people wrote made a difference. And all of a sudden I became interested in, how do you measure the ways people write? And I ended up uh, working with students to create a computer program called Linguistic Inquiry Word Count, L-I-W-C or LUC. And the LUC program could go into any given text and analyze language. And what I discovered was that a lot of words that I'd never paid any attention to were related to personality, to, to the ways people thought, the way they organized things, the way they connected with others. And then they, they were these little dumb words, you know, pronouns, prepositions, articles, conjunctions, auxiliary verbs. Who cares about those? I certainly didn't. And, but then I started to discover it was those words that said the most about personality and psychological state and they were even relevant to expressive writing. So that's what motivated me into the, into the world of words, which I'm not sure I would have ever got into, but I had no choice. The right. words, <laughs> the pronouns were calling. <laughs> yes, well, when you get sucked into the word of worlds, it's a little bit like, you know, the Hotel California around here. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Um, so uh, just so that we're defining our terms from the beginning, tell us what expressive writing is. So expressive writing is a kind of a generic term for uh, a, a technique of writing whereby individuals are write about, an, uh, it could be an upsetting experience, it could be a positive experience, but an emotionally significant experience for relatively briefly, maybe 10, 15 minutes a time, maybe once a day, maybe for three or four consecutive days. It could be more, it could be less. There's no hard and fast rules, but it's essentially a focused kind of writing where the person is 
simply exploring their thoughts and feelings about an issue. And what I've always felt it was, was kind of a life course correction. So here we all are floating in life, being buffeted by uh, often upsetting experiences like COVID, like Black Lives Matter, like other kinds of issues that are, are deeply personal. And often we don't talk about them. We keep them to ourselves. We, but they're there. We, we mull over them. We sometimes have trouble sleeping because we're thinking about it. And then we sometimes say, well, I should talk to somebody about it. No, no, I'm not going to do that because it would just upset them and it would upset me. Or I could write about it. No, that would just upset me more. But the reality is, is that what I discovered was that by writing briefly about that thing, those things that were bothering you, it brought about these really impressive changes. So that, so expressive writing is different from diary writing or writing in a journal. By doing it, I am not asking you to devote the rest of your life to writing. It's just, it's a brief fix that can be beneficial. And is it meant to be shared? If you want, I don't really care. Uh, in fact, that's the beauty of it. There are no hard and fast rules. I never share it. When I write, I write it and I might save it somewhere. Uh, sometimes I'll throw it away, but it's, I view the writing, it's the process of writing that's primarily for myself. It's not for an audience. It's for me to try to understand what's going on in, in my life with the, these issues that are bothering me. And you've been studying this for decades. How, how do you go about attaching some sort of a quantifiable outcome to expressive writing? So um, I started this, the first article on this was published in 1986. So it goes back a long time. And I, I actually haven't been doing that much work on it for the last 20 years because other people are doing some remarkable work. But the idea of it, uh, the idea of it was it what I had found prior to the first expressive writing study was that people who had had traumatic experiences and had not talked about them with others were more likely to get sick after that event than those people who had this the same kind of traumatic experience but who did talk to others. And so it occurred to me that it was related to physical health and that if we could bring people in the laboratory and have them write about some kind of upsetting experience, I would, my sense was it would help them to organize it, to understand it, to think about it. And then uh, it would improve, ultimately improve their health. And the way it would improve their health was, think about what talking does. I'm upset about something. I go and talk to you, for example, and, as I'm talking, I start to understand it better. And just putting it into words will bring about some kind of understanding for me. And in doing that, I won't, there's no reason for me to continue thinking about it. And what my brain is doing when I've had an upsetting experience is my brain is trying to understand what in the world happened. How can I avoid that in the future? What role did I play? And what writing does is it serves those functions. And if I do that, I'll sleep better. And mm -hmm. we know that sleep is related to health. And we know this reduces general stress. And all there have been um, now over a thousand studies on expressive writing. And you stand back and you look at them all, and it really does paint this interesting picture that writing helps sleep, it helps immune function, it reduces cardiovascular load. It, uh, and it's associated with all of these markers. And after people write about it, it frees their mind in a sense. There's a lot of work on working memory that when we have, when we're under stress, when we're bugged about something, we keep thinking about it, which makes it harder for us to remember. Many people talk about when they're under stress, their memory goes to, goes to hell. And it does go to hell because you aren't processing, you're, you're processing this upsetting experience and not these other things going on in your life. And once that your mind is stilled, if you like, from writing about it, you are a better listener. You're a better friend. And we have some data to suggest that people are more connected with others when they uh, 
write about upsetting experiences. Well, I find it so interesting that the therapeutic benefits of sorting out the story, making some sense of it, turning it into a narrative, and then kind of letting it go, <laughs> you know, um, are in the writing because in the talking, you're also adding sympathy from a friend, a social connection, you know, other things that are also therapeutic. Um, so it's interesting to me that it's the writing that's the key. Well, I, I'm not going to say that it's the key. I think putting into words is, is a primary key. But one thing that is the downside of talking is, yes, if I tell you my story and you say, oh, Jamie, you, you, I can see why you're so upset. I completely validate your existence. I'm going to feel great. But if you say, wow, you are such a fool. No wonder that happened to you. Uh, that's going to be worse than not than my by not saying anything. So so much depends on how the other people are affected by it. And one reason we keep secrets is because we are concerned that um, what we say might in, might adversely affect my our friendships with others. And they can. They really can. So I think that's you're always having to play off is it safe to talk to this other person about this? Whereas with writing, you don't even have to answer that, ask that question. Yeah, the paper doesn't talk back. Yes. Yeah. Um, I should say that in addition to this, just sort of being a fascinating exploration of words, one of the reasons we're talking about this now is um, there was a New York Times article probably about six weeks ago, end of June, um, that talked about the need to make sense of the pandemic that, um, especially at the end of June, before the Delta variant had been so emergent, people were sort of feeling like they were on the cusp of re-entering life and they wanted to celebrate and put this behind it, us and, you know, look forward, not back. And um, it was, you know, there is benefit in processing a trauma and um, pushing it behind you and, you know, soldiering on is not necessarily the way to get through it. Um, do you, what, what are you thinking about the power of expressive writing in the context of this pandemic? No, I think uh, as with any upsetting experience, that writing can be beneficial. And I want to uh, make it clear, I'm not a, a salesman. I, I'm, I'm not selling a product. <laughs> uh, and it doesn't always work. It's sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. The, the research evidence suggests that it probably does. For you, you scientists out there, the effect size is about a point, between a 0.13, maybe a 0.18, something like that. But those are fairly big effects when you're looking at real world behaviors. And what that means is, if you set aside 15 minutes a day for three or four days to write about your thoughts and feelings about the pandemic and your, the ways that you're dealing with it, thinking about it, there is a decent chance that this will help you sleep better. This will help you um, negotiate a, a, an easier, happier, healthier life. It's highly unlikely that it's going to completely change your life. And it's highly unlikely it's going to make anything worse. And sometimes we find that writing in one, one occasion works. And then you write it again, the next time you have an upsetting experience, it doesn't seem to do much, much good. But my attitude is, come on, it's free. It, it's uh, easy to do. There are no rules. And it's, uh, it's, it's a very simple tool to try out. Well, if people want to try it out, how, how do we go about starting? Okay, let's do it. All so right. <laughs> I'm going, I, I want to give everybody just a, a, a simple opportunity to do this. What I'd like you to do is you can you you can get uh, pen and paper, you can type on you know open word and you can type there, or you can do something that that I have uh, found to be helpful is finger writing, which means you need to get out your finger and then you can just write in the air. And what I'm going to do is I, I want you to in, in just a minute you're going to write for about five minutes. And in your writing, as soon as we begin, I want you to really let go and to address a topic that is bugging you, bothering you. Now, 
I don't want you to deal with a major traumatic experience right now. We don't have time. So five minutes is good for that annoying neighbor to write about, but it's not, you know, we're not gonna be, I don't recommend writing about how you were abused as a child or uh, the murder you committed. So let's let's keep this. <laughs> I I know about you out there. <laughs> I, I I want you to think about something that is an annoyance, and in your writing, just let go and write. Now, what do you write about? I don't know. Just you might even begin. Why is this event bothering me so much? What what is it that is just getting gnawing at me? And, and affecting my sleep or I'm thinking about too much. So that's it. So over the years, I've had um, thousands of people do this, the, do this test. And we'll, we'll do it one more time before it's over tonight. And many people expect that after the writing that, that they will feel much more free and happy and joyous. But the reality is, most of you probably are feeling a little bit worse. And you're thinking, thanks a lot, Jamie. That's just, that's just why I came here. What's interesting about this is when people first get into a topic, if you're, if you're successful, you start to get a better sense of what the issue is, what the problem is. I, I see Holly Hexter writes that uh, with her writing, she she's starting to understand the issues better, but she doesn't have a solution. And in some ways, having a solution is, is uh, that's down the road often. But just the mere clarification of the question, just labeling the issue often is really beneficial. And this, these are some of the dimensions that we've discovered over the years about writing that makes it so interesting. It seems to make a difference for several reasons. One is just the mere labeling of an experience and, and similarly an acknowledgement that it actually happened. But a second is, is that by writing about it, it forces some structure. It's really interesting. It, there's historically been all of this research looking at what happens in terms of the ways that we represent something. So we all have a sense of of how a person thinks or feels or whatever, or how we think and feel. But then when we try to encapsulate it into words, we have to restructure it. We have to simplify it and organize it. And that simplification and organization may distort it some, but hey, who cares? It's now more organized. And which also means that you're gonna be obsessing about it less. And then another important issue is the, is the, the acknowledgement of the the emotions that are associated with it. And so all of these things that the labeling, the emotions, the, the organization and structure, and ultimately uh, meaning, finding some meaning or, or value to it uh, is, is another thing that, that often occurs. Another thing that I've loved about this, and I can't, it, you know, I started all of this when I was in my thirties and I was not a, the most introspective person you've ever met. It, and I believe my wife will back me up on this. And she, she might even say that I'm still not the most introspective person that she's met. <laughs> I don't know why, but uh, I was, one thing that struck me from the very beginning was often I'd be dealing with an issue and I'd sit down and I'd start writing about it. And after about two or three minutes, I would be so bored with what I was writing with. And I realized that wasn't the issue at all. And all of a sudden, my writing would take me in a really different direction. And that, that was the thing that was really gnawing at me more. Almost using the writing in this really loose way to help guide my thinking about something. And I think anybody who's, who has a job that is, it involves writing in some way. So I'm... As a researcher, I do a lot of writing of papers and chapters and things, things like that. And I'm every time I write a paper, the, the paper ends up being a different paper than I started because the words took me in a different direction that really demanded a kind of structure that my pre-existing expectations didn't, didn't fit. So that's a long, 
a long answer to your question, Rebecca. Well, the five minutes was an interesting time frame. Though it started to feel a little long for writing about a minor annoyance, and that did make you go a level deeper. Um, you know, and finally by the end of it, I was like, I've already wasted too much time on this stupid little thing. It's minor. <laughs> Yeah, five, five minutes is enough in a lot of ways, it felt like, although you cautioned us not to take on anything too huge. With yeah, well, and, you know, when I did the very first studies, uh, I had people write 20 minutes for four consecutive days, but, you know, I didn't know how long to have people write, and we found really good effects. People, our very first studies were with college students at uh, a, a private college I was teaching at the time where all the students, most of the students were from out of state and they all lived on campus. And the health center was right in the middle of all the dorms, which was, I, I later learned was just the way you want to do research on health. Because if, if the doctor is close, people are more likely to go. But what we found was that people who wrote about these uh, traumatic experiences for four days, uh, 20 minutes a day, ended up going to the student health center at about half the rates as people in our control conditions over the next several months. In our second study, we worked with Jan Kiko Glazer and her husband, Ron Glazer, who were doing work on immunology and psychoneuroimmunology. And we drew blood before they were assigned to condition and then afterwards and after writing and then six weeks later. And we found that writing was associated with improved immune function as well. And other studies started to show these same kinds of effects. But what was interesting is the first study we had four, right, four times, 20 minutes a time. The second study, I didn't have as much time to do the study. So we had to write only 15 minutes and that worked fine. And then the next study, I thought, well, let's try three days. And so we had them do three days, 15 minutes a time. And then other labs started dip, doing different work. So Laura King and her group at University of Missouri tried having people write five minutes and two minutes. And even that's brought about positive yeah. effects. So there's no one true way here. And if it's one, two, three, four, five times, they, they all seem to work. Uh, I, I, my gut sense is kind of a minimum of twice would probably be a good idea. And three might even be better. You know, a lot depends on the issues that you're dealing with. Do you find that it, it, there's a measurable difference in effect depending on the issue you're dealing with? No, that, I mean, that's what's so, it, it, this is maybe this is one reason there there have been over a thousand studies is uh, everybody is trying to figure out well what's the perfect way of writing surely those first instructions aren't the perfect instructions and no they're not but it uh, it seems like almost any instruction works and it seems like how long you write seems to work there's there's and you know for me I don't write that often I write when you know horrible things happen but not that horrible. But the kind of stuff that I go to bed and I either can't fall asleep or I wake up in the middle of the night thinking about it. And that might be once or twice a year. And sometimes I write for two minutes. Sometimes I write for 20 minutes. Sometimes I write twice. Usually I just write once. And typically that's beneficial. Hmm. You mentioned your own lack of introspection. Are there types of people that it's more effective for? And again, Dozens of studies have tried to identify the types of people. The very first study suggested that men would benefit more. We all went, oh, that makes sense. And then the next study found that women benefited more. And other <laughs> people said, oh, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> and there have been all these studies. And it seems as though men and women both benefit at, at about the same rates. And neurotic people and non-neurotic, they all seem to benefit as well. And is there anything in the style of writing or word choice that is effective? Um, you know, there's certain things that are kind of important. One is, is being self-reflective seems to be really important. Another one is there's a big difference between writing and bitching. So if your writing is just whining and complaining and blowing off steam, we've typically found that not to be beneficial. Also, starting off with a good coherent story with the beginning, middle, and end is associated with no health improvements, probably because you already have a story. And one of the things that I think writing does is it, it, it pushes people to come up with a story. One other thing that we find is 
right people benefit the most when they are able to change their perspective in their writing in other words if you're writing the same kind of story on the last day of writing as the first day you don't benefit it's and in fact you may just be ruminating and that's almost the definition of depression that is when when you're telling the same story over and over again you just aren't there's there's no change you're not there's no benefit that's accruing so i think part of it is working to come to a different understanding of what that experience was. Hmm. Um, I found myself just, um, I think out of habit, writing in the first person, um, writing specifically about sort of my thoughts and feelings. I didn't pay any attention to narrative arc or character development or you mm -hmm. know things that actually make it more of a story. Um, and I certainly wasn't eloquent or lyrical in any way. Um, and and it, that's, actually, that's what I kind of like to see on the first day of writing is, is or the first episode of writing, where it's, it's more kind of a brain dump, where you're just, you're describing what happened, you're confused about things, that, that, that makes sense. That's what, that's kind of what you would expect. And that, that, uh, a narrative comes later. Hmm. Um, should we try it again? Are we ready to try it again? Sure. It, it, it continues. It continues to be free. Okay. So, <laughs> so this time, you can write about the same same event, a different event. It's entirely up to you. Or you might even try to connect that event with something else. And and I want you to this time again, really try to get into the experience and explore your thoughts and feelings in terms of um, how it's affected you. And um, what, well, I'm going to leave it at that. So what I'm guessing is many of you feel a little bit better after that second time. Um, how about you, Rebecca? Do you feel better? Yeah. That's the correct answer. <laughs> That's a good thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes, it would have been a real shame to have to replace you. <laughs> if I were sitting here in tears, yeah. And um, we're, so we're not going to do any more writing, but I, the, the goal of this really has been just to give you a sense of how writing works. It, there's, no, there's no magic to it. And at the very beginning, someone asked the difference between this and journaling. I view journaling as a more life intensive uh, approach to writing or, and there, and you know, I, I think I probably always avoided diaries and journals because they just seems like so much pressure. Oh God, don't make me write again today. Whereas this is, it's more an as needed approach. It's kind of the, 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 the penicillin of uh, writing. You know, you know, you don't need penicillin all the time and don't take too much penicillin. Uh, but but when when you need it, take it. And when you don't need it, go and enjoy life. I find too much introspection can be a bad thing that um, often. You, so, for example, when something good happens to me, the last thing on Earth I want to do is be too introspective because I want to really jump in and really relish the, the joy of what's happening. So that, that's my, again, I'm, it, that's, I'm interjecting my own personal philosophy here. <laughs> Instead of watching yourself enjoy it. Or <laughs> exactly. Why you're not that's enjoying right. it or, yeah. That's right, that's right. I also wondered if, and I, I realized that not only was the second five minutes a little bit more productive for me and the writing was a little better, have you? Um, found people who um, turn this into kind of an art form and realize what I'm actually here doing is poetry or, uh, you know, writing a memoir. You know, I have, I've, I have had people tell me that. And, uh, and you can see how, eas how easily by starting this, it can help take you down a number of different uh, roads that, 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 can satisfy probably your curiosity or stories you've wanted to tell or ways of organizing your life or ways of putting together stories that could benefit the next generation. There's so many 
ways that this, that this writing strategy, uh, I think, can affect us. Um, do you have hints for people who might feel sort of stuck or want to get at the heart of the matter faster? Um, no. <laughs> uh, what I, it, I've always been interested in, in writer's block. And I think anybody who writes professionally, that happens to occasionally. And what I've, I, I use uh, writing often, sometimes almost as free writing. So I'm, for example, I recently started a chapter. It was the last thing on earth I wanted to write. And I couldn't get started. The hardest thing for me is getting started. And it, so I started off, why is this? And so this is, I'm writing the paper. Why is this so hard? What's the matter? <laughs> and, and, and I would do come back the next day, the same thing, start trying to explore it. And then all of a sudden, well, I know I want to say, da, 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 and all of a sudden I'm off to the races. What I tell people, if you have trouble writing about an upsetting experience, uh, just repeat what you've already written. Uh, just the, the, the rule that I used to always give people is just start writing and write continuously. If you run out of things, repeat what you've, you've written. And, you know, I've seen thousands of writing samples and it's true, a small number of people do repeat themselves maybe for two or three times, but after two or three times, that's too boring. It, then they, they go off on their own. I'd suspect I know the answer to this since you suggested people write with their finger, but do you ever recommend people go back and reread what they've written? Again, they, they're big individual differences. When I started this, one of my uh, graduate students, Martha Francis, uh, she, I think she came to work with me because she was interested in my, in the writing work I was doing. And she wrote, and she always went back and would uh, go back and re re read what she had written and then edit it. And she always felt that that worked much better than regular writing. And I believe her, I would never do that myself. I've gone back and looked at my old writing and I look, it's so depressing. And I think, I can't believe I'm the most depressive person in the world, but I only write when I'm down. So for me, I. So I think people need to approach it any way that they think best. Mm -hmm. We have a question from Sarah who says, I found that each time I ended up posing so many questions to myself. What's that about? I don't know, Sarah. <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> but, I mean, that's, that's it, in some ways almost the point is that it's clear that you are now digging into this and becoming more curious about what are the issues that are going on here. So yeah, those questions probably have needed to be asked and I'm glad you did that. Um, Lana in the chat says, for bilingual people, does it make a difference what language the creative writing is done? Is mother tongue better than language learned and by better meaning, is it more effective? Well, that's a, that's a, a wonderful question. Um, We've done some work on uh, issues associated with bi bilingual issues. In fact, somebody who is uh, here today, Nairon uh, Ramirez has done some of this work and also uh, another student, Young Suk Kim. Uh, and with this, what we find is that people who write in, in general, writing in English versus your native tongue, uh, it doesn't seem to make a huge difference. And one of, the, one of the studies that we did in our lab, we found that the people who actually went back and forth between language and their native tongue, they tended to benefit more than people who wrote just in one language. And I think part of that is that by writing in two languages, it forces a, a kind of a different organizational structure because the languages draw on different life experience, different emotional issues as well. So I think in some ways, if you can do both, that might be worth experimenting with. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting question. I mean, I am to my shame monolingual English, but I, when I talk to people who are fluent in more than one language, 
choosing which emotion to express in which language is conscious, right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, someone asks where your studies are published. Uh, if you go to my website, uh, you can see links to to where they're published. I have I've published uh, a lot of articles, and they are in mostly in psychology journals. Sometimes they'll be in uh, more broader journals, um, and occasionally in you know all sorts. They're they're everywhere. They're everywhere. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, the New York Times article referenced you have been studying this for 30 years. Is that right? I'd say longer. So let, let's go with 35. May, well, yeah, yeah. No, I'd say it's 35 since the first publication on writing. Huh. Um, Michelle asks, would there be too many times to write about the same thing? Would there be too many times to write about the same thing? Like if you feel like you haven't come to a conclusion, could it end up just becoming ruminating or just not figuring it out yet? So I, my, again, I, I just speak from my own personal experience. If you write about the same thing and you write about it the same way over and over again, multiple times, it's not going to get it continued writing is probably not going to make any difference. And so either change the way you're writing about it or go do something else, go jogging, go, go to a bar, right. you know, I, I know uh, yoga or something healthy. Just some other way of clearing your mind. That's right. That's right. Yeah. I'm really actually interested in this aspect of using writing to clear your mind because um, you would think that as Michelle alluded to, in some ways it concentrates your mind on the subject, but the fact that that is then freeing is a step I hadn't really considered. You know, it's very interesting. Um, Larry Wright wrote a, a, a really interesting book on uh, Scientology. The name of it was Going Clear. And within Scientology, something that I do not subscribe to, the idea is to clearing your mind essentially. But this idea of having a clear mind is at the heart of uh, all sorts of med meditations and others. And I feel as though this is one thing that expressive writing and, and therapy and other ways of coming to terms with something can help us to, to clear our minds some. In fact, one of the first places I saw this was uh, many years ago, uh, Daryl Bam, who was doing some interesting work on hypnosis, uh, what he would do before he would try to hypnotize people, he'd have them come in and write, write out what is on your mind right now. And he found if he did that, they, they were much more susceptible to hypnosis because they weren't huh. rehearsing the issues that they were, they were dealing with. Wow. Um, somebody asks, does the timing of the writing after the event matter? For example, Ooh, both to the event or long after it. That's a great question. Uh, yes, I think expressive writing immediately after a terrible trauma is probably a bad idea. Uh, I think, and there's some evidence for this from from multiple quarters. For example, there used to very it used to be very popular critical incident stress debriefing that immediately after a horrible car accident or something that first responders should immediately get into it and start uh, talking and doing emotional processing. And there's some work to suggest that that's probably uh, harmful for some people. I, my general rule is if you find yourself thinking about something too much, writing can be beneficial. And by too much, that's you're thinking about it at this level that's above what anybody would expect. So if you've had a horrible traumatic experience and you're thinking about it all the time today and tomorrow uh, or the day afterwards, that's normal. That's not too much. That's within, within normal. But if you're still thinking about it all the time a year from now, that's too much. If you find that you've run out of friends to go and talk to about it and, they, and your friends are avoiding you when they see you because you're going to talk about it that's a sign that writing might be beneficial.
We have a question that says, I'm a recently graduated BSN student, soon to be an RN. As a future medical professional, I'd love to carry this tool into my clinical practice. I'm interested in exploring how this therapeutic tool is currently being utilized. So it's being used in all sorts of places. And one place, if you're interested in the literature that I would recommend doing, go to Google Scholar. And in Google Scholar, just enter expressive writing and, in, in this case, nursing. And you will see multiple studies that have been done in, the, in nursing, at least on the research side. And once you see who's doing it in, on the research side, you could email those people and ask, are they doing this in practice? Where, the, where are they doing it? So I know it, it is being done in, in nursing, and I know it's, been, it's being done in... Uh, in social work, it's being done in, in all sorts of professions. It's uh, the variations of it are very common now in prisons and just all over the place. So this is a fairly broad strategy. So we are almost out of time, but I want to sort of say if people are interested in exploring this, will you give them some kind of, I know you've said it, it's really up to you, but some best practices, some way to get ways to get started, some things to think about, just some guidance about how to explore this for themselves. You bet. Also, I want to call out to Cindy Chung, who's here today as well. She she's part of the she she's worked also on the board with the museum, and Cindy has been critical in in my development in terms of expressive writing, but especially with language and words. And so she's, she's somebody who is a, uh, has really made a difference, I think, in the Word Museum, but also just in, in working in my lab for years. Okay, in terms of uh, best practices, this is not magic, it's not a panacea, but it, 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 it generally works. And uh, if you find that you're thinking about something too much, just set aside some time where you're going to be by yourself and promise yourself that you'll write, let's say, at least three times, at least 10 minutes each time. Uh, what you do with the writing, it, it, it doesn't matter. The primary issue is you don't want it to be left out where someone else could read it and it would uh, hurt their feelings. It would hurt your feelings or whatever. So be, be careful with, with, with your writing. Uh, and that's one reason actually why I like finger writing. Um, another is if you find that you're not making headway, that you're saying the same thing over and over again, you're not finding it beneficial. That tells me that it's not beneficial. Try something else or change your perspective in your writing. Um, I do not recommend writing this as a letter to somebody else, especially someone else, and then you're planning to send it. I think that writing is best when you know this is for you. I suppose writing a letter that you know you're not going to write might be, might be good, but writing what you've, mailing off what you've written, I, I, I think that changes the way that you are constructing this in your mind, that the writing needs to be for yourself. I think the most important thing for me, and I say this now as, as a researcher myself, is be an experimentist, a, an experimentalist. I want you to don't trust anything I've said. See what works for you. And, and you know, some people think you should, you should write with your non-dominant hand. Try it. Some people think you should, um, you, know, you know, who knows, write in blood. If you want, try it. The boy, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I don't recommend it. But uh, some people find that setting up a ritual when you write, you know, lighting a candle or, uh, or, or things like that. Try it. Try things and see what works and take some notes so that one thing that I think is a really good marker is how well are you sleeping? Do you have a Fitbit or something like that that can tell you your, how well you're sleeping or your, uh, when you wake up, can you make some note of how well you're sleeping? 
Are you trying to lose weight? Are you trying to stop smoking? Are you trying to drink less? All of those might be things for you to just to monitor and see if writing is having an effect. So work to find out what work, uh, what feels best when you write, but also be a scientist and start to measure some, some of your own behavior to try to get a sense of what is bringing about change with you. So those are, those are some of my general recommendations. Excellent. Well, James Pennebaker, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you for the last hour. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been a treat talking with you as well. Um, and thank you all so much for being here and for your ongoing support of Planet Word. Uh, we hope you'll come see us in person soon. Good night. <laughs>